في عالم تتشابك فيه السياسة والغذاء يظل أمن الغذاء غضية محورية من حقول الأرز في آسيا إلى مناطق زراعة الذرة في أمريكا يؤثر إنتاج الغذاء بكل منطقة في استقرار العالم ويمكن للقرارات السياسية أن تحدث تغيرات في أسواق الغذاء ما يؤثر في الأسعار والتوافر عالمياً وفي حين أصبحت سياسات التجارة وشبكات النقل شرايين الحياة لتوزيع الغذاء وأدوات جيوسياسية استراتيجية فإنه بالنسبة إلى الكثيرين ليست هذه السياسات مجرد عناوين رئيسية بل هي عوامل تحدد وجبتهم التالية وبينما تتنقل الأمم في هذه الديناميكيات المعقدة ما دور التعاون والابتكار في ضمان مستقبل غذائي آمن للجميع وعند الحديث عن الجغرافيا السياسية لأمن الغذاء كيف يمكن لكل قرار جيوسياسي أن يغير موازين الجوع والوفرة الغذائية؟ هذه الأسئلة وغيرها نناقشها مع سعادة الدكتور عبد الناصر جمال الشعالي في محاضرة اليوم بعنوان جيوسياسية الأمن الغذائي In the name of Allah, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and peace be upon you from E. Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and on behalf of His Excellency Dr. Sultan al Naimi, Director General of the Center, I'm Amna al Kudbi, the head of the in, uh, economic studies in the center. Th and I greet you and thank you for your attendance. And we also welcome you to. Uh, new lecture of uh, Emirates Mufakkiru uh, al-Emirat, where we host uh, a number of uh, innovative and creative uh, Emirati minds in the framework of uh, the country's hosting of COP28, where international efforts will work on climate change and combating climate change. Today, we'll tackle an important topic, which is uh, the geopolitics of food security, because it means stability, and the insufficiency is an incursor of instability and triads. And realizing this fact, His Highness Mohammed bin Rashid said our water and food security is part of our national security and the sustainability of our food and water resources is a guarantee of this stability and to discuss the aspects of this topic we are happy to this to host his excellency Dr. Abdel Nasser Jamal Shali UAE's ambassador to India he was appointed in in September 22 ambassador to India and His Excellency is having PhD from National Australian University, and he has master degree from uh, where the, uh, management from Sorbonne Abu Dhabi. And before uh, and, uh, being uh, uh, appointed uh, uh, as ambassador, he was uh, previously his, uh, assistant minister of economic and uh, trade affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and he is a member of the Univers Zayed University. Uh, Board and His Excellency also teaches uh, the geopolitics of food security in Anwar Gargash Diplomatic, uh, Diplomatic Academy. Your Excellency, could you please brief us about the policies of UAE in the field of food security and what are the future plans to achieve this stability? First of all, uh, peace be upon you and thank you for the efforts and the ho my hosting or having me here. In the beginning, there was a question from His Excellency, the uh, Foreign Affairs Minister. He called me and said, Abdel Nasser, how can we assess the sec uh, food security fr uh, from uh, UAE's perspective? How can we have a different way where we should invest? Where should we bring our food? And that was before the pandemic and uh, disruptions in the uh, supply chain. Later, studies uh, embraced many aspects, uh, strategic, political relations, and are we investing in a certain uh, regions where can they be up to uh, having or might be having uh, riots in the future? Based on this ground, the question changed into a thesis, PhD thesis, where we had lists for countries from 1961 upwards. The rating and ranking we wanted 
to see that these countries who claim to be self-sufficient in terms of food, was it really the case or just was relative? Sometimes this is relative because the self sufficiency of food security is 90-95%. This means that the country produces that amount or percentage of that uh, crop. For example, if you are talking about a crop and you are saying that the 90% of self-sufficiency about uh, wheat, this means you are talking about this product only. So the total that exists and the percentage of producing that crop. Though 90% of China, is it the same 90% and like for example Putan? No, at all. We are talking we are talking here about a population that is above one billion and the other one is less than uh, maybe around one million. So when we are talking about self-sufficiency we have to assess is it enough? Here the question is this crop enough for the population then we discuss the investment uh, potentials and then how to invest as UAE in that country. Accordingly we discussed or targeted rice, wheat, and, and during the pandemic, there was an assessment for other uh, products that are most imported or needed by UAE. As a person or as an individual, I, as an individual, I'm not uh, concerned that I have uh, tomato or not, but the population... Uh, they want tomato and that's important. In India, onion, it's very important for the Indians. So the Indian government, uh, it's difficult for the Indian government to change the policies uh, and the planning about uh, onions. McDonald's the, uh, in India said there would be no tomato because uh, of a lack and shortage of tomato in India. And I was at a business trip, uh, business uh, L banquet and uh, our minister here said I can uh, e bring you here or export to India tomato if you want. So the products and agricultural products differ from country to country and because of the diversity of nationalities in UAE we need to have uh, different and diverse products uh, reg uh, other than the staple uh, crops. So 70 years we had livestock, fish, date, and uh, dairy products. But when we had uh, the diversity of uh, nationalities in UAE and the national or demographic fabric changed, so we had that amount or the need for diversifying our products. So during the pandemic, the main role played by ministry, foreign ministry under the directives of the leadership and His uh, Highness, uh, particularly His Highness Sheikh Mohammed, may God protect him. These are the staple products or main products, uh, 18 uh, products by then. And and each one we have to find or look two or three uh, countries where, from where we can import these uh, uh, basic and the staple products, whether we have diplomatic relations with these countries or not. Your Excellency, UAE is importing 85% of its food. Uh, climate change uh, affected and impact, impacted the food security. What are the challenges of UAE's uh, encountering in terms of uh, food security, in, in terms of climate changes, in terms of uh, natural disasters? Most of the world countries, if we analyze the situation, none, no country has genuine self-sufficiency, even with the existence of, as I said, 90% of 95% percentages. There could be some kind of support and subsidy for farmers, like in the USA, even a Brexit in the in, in, in UK had to do with the farmers' support and uh, how can we subsidize such basic and staple products. So uh, here we are talking either about uh, supporting one particular commodity or a product or a produce 
yield or talking about population. And the same here in terms of India. So if self-sufficiency is not the essential for UAE, so we have to find what we can produce locally, not to achieve 100% self-sufficiency, but to have part of local consumption be produced locally internally to save a, a, a hard currency. Second part is import. For, me, for import, am I importing rice from five countries or I'm exporting, importing this from 25 to 30 countries. If I divide the uh, countries from which I import, I have 50% to or 40 to 50 comes come from two countries, India and Pakistan. My relations are good with India and Pakistan, but sometimes we have, let me suppose there is a change in government sometimes uh, relations can change. This might affect and impact my food security. In this case, I have to find what are other uh, uh, sources that I can depend on to get or obtain my rice and wheat, for example. So some of the countries that presented were presented that are able to produce what the UAEs need which is around uh, 500 to 800 tons. I'm talking here rice on not only the countries that Italy, we had Italy, Ecuador, also Myanmar in Asia, which are still not, ha have not uh, established uh, supply chains with these countries in addition to Pakistan and India, as I mentioned before. Thank you, Your Excellency. During the previous time, we found an international uh, trend for fragmentation where, uh, because some countries were uh, tending to have uh, protect uh, uh, policies about food. How will this impact the supply chain in terms of food? In 2008, when the international crisis took place, and or with that crisis, there was food crisis. And the food crisis, and that was really even worse, that took place and during COVID. We felt COVID because we were uh, home locked, uh, home bound, and people uh, did not were not certain. There was an atmosphere of uncertainty about uh, obtaining and having access to food. This doesn't mean that the country is not able, no, but because the market was fluctuating, was uh, uh, oscillating. So here, this, you know, as you know, the markets were not stable. So in 2008, there was many factors because there was a speculation in the prices for monopoly, also uh, biofuels, uh, for example, methane with the toll to, this is related to uh, oil and energy policies, but one of the main reasons was the entry of India and China went into the market to buy such a staple foods to their population. So when I'm, when I'm talking about a huge uh, population, like 2 billion, like such as India and uh, China, to buy any product on the market game is over. This means no country at all can buy the food product at a normal or rational price. That was the reason why, as we said, China and India wanted to buy all possible food products on the market. So countries believe that the protectionism uh, has long-term benefits. So when we have protectionist policies, it could be vary between tax on exports without paying fees to the government or ban directly any export of food. In one year or two years, the impact, so the price for one or two years will not rise and locally this depends on uh, the 
what we are talking about, what product we are talking about from. But if more countries join this protectionist or ban on export, the scenario will be totally different. And this will create problems in terms of a price availability and how this will affect the prices and food security internally in some countries. Egypt, for example, has some policies in uh, subsidizing uh, bread, for example, that will affect also. Your Excellency, in some cases such as COVID, UAE being a logistical hub and uh, we are talking here about uh, a big amount of exports and UAE has achieved a record uh, amount uh, in, in, in exports. It reached 2.2 trillion. Can the country benefit, benefit from its strategic location and logistical capabilities to be an umbrella for storing basic goods? So during like in COVID, can we have a storage of food for eight months? So can UAE again benefit from its uh, strategic lo uh, location to re-export and be a center or hub for food storage with uh, World uh, tr uh, Trade uh, Organization in terms of food export and storage? Storage. Here we have two parts. This role was played by uh, Netherlands and Europe uh, 200 years ago. They did the same with maize or corn. It wa maize will be stored and will not be uh, uh, sold on the market if the price is low. So the price will not go lower. And when the price becomes higher or when we have a drought or problems in the supply disruptions, they start uh, uh, supplying the markets to balance the price and availability of the products. As for UAE, is that possible? Yes, it's possible. And uh, essentially, this is an, uh, an essential element for food security in UAE. In the Middle East today, it as population, in terms of population, we are 4 to 5 percent of the international uh, population. But what we are producing is 1 percent. Not So not only UAE, but the Middle East is depending mainly on export, not on uh, of food, not in producing its own food. So this means UAE cannot be uh, 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 stable or uh, sufficient in terms of food. Saudi tried one day to produce or grow wheat. That was in the 90s, even before the 90s. But in the 90s, King KSA started to be one, became to be one of the 10 wheat exporters in the world. Of course, farmers were supported by the government. But later on, it became very costly, and uh, there was no feasibility for uh, Saudi Kingdom to uh, produce wheat anymore. And it went back again to being an importer of wheat. So here, climate plays a role. Saudi succeeded in producing wheat, but later on it had to stop growing because the feasibility and started to import it. So Gulf and Middle East in general, should all the countries, not only UAE and Gulf states, most of the Middle East countries must have a storage of food to achieve its food stability. And this should be done in collaboration with other countries and other partners. Your Excellency, you know UAE uh, in terms of climate and in terms of size don't help UAE to be self-sufficient. But based on technology, can UAE uh, depend on this and what are the directions yes we have uh, and technology can help for example producing some kind of vegetables fruits fisheries or fish farms but this cannot be generalized on staple commodities 
you can produce some commodities and goods for uh, local consumption but today as UAE can I produce wheat as an experiment yes and I can experiment many uh, uh, products and find which can live and grow and succeed in my country but can this limited produce or yield cover my need of in terms of food security and need can I do this with the rice also no I cannot because rice is different I'm here talking about 500 to 800 tons I don't have the ability and I don't have the potential to reach such number even if I tried with some other types of uh, uh, products uh, modified products or modified uh, 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 rice that can uh, take less water and can stand uh, dry weather yes as experiment scientific research in terms of scientific research and experiment yes this is possible but to cover my consumption locally and re-export that's no thank you very much his excellency the ambassador for this valuable information now we open the floor for discussion if please make it as brief as possible after introducing introducing yourself just a question Thank you, Your Excellency, for this interesting discussion. Abdurrahman Haddadi from uh, ECSSR. You said there is a plan for diversity of food products as a precaution for any disruptions. So, is there any reaction? For example, we see this ex uh, ex importer is trying to reduce the amount he is importing can create can this create any challenges no not by necessity 20 years ago we we were importing uh, wheat and the bread more than india and pakistan it, so it depends on the percentage and the time in which this percentage is reduced at the end, it's all uh, in terms of uh, trade and uh, commerce, because, you know, at the end of the day, traders are doing and merchants are doing this. So I have to have a plan to reduce this gradually and uh, depend on or diversify the countries from which I import. There was what we call uh, rice diplomacy, such as Thailand has always a surplus of rice because they have uh, policies to, sub uh, to the government always support the farmers. Uh, they buy the rice at good prices stored till the market is suitable for uh, better prices. So Thailand government or Thai government, depending on the market prices, it can win or benefit, achieve profits or lose. Now, we have storage. I was talking to a discussion with the Thai ambassador. Why don't we take this amount of rice and store it here in UAE with a long term contract? five ten years contract we buy rice from a stable or fixed price and the government uh, can uh, also achieve some profits and uh, make uh, up for any losses and we as uae benefit from the prices along with less dependence on other countries God bless you, Saleh al uh, researcher and uh, strategic analyst. Thank you for the highlights in economy. When we are talking about food security, we are talking about the most important uh, component of national security, food, economic, and 
social, all other aspects of security. My question is, how can we balance between the resources and population? As you know, in some countries, the population, the population or birth growth is fixed or sometimes going down while the resources are going uh, higher, natural resources, I mean here. And other countries, the uh, population is growing fast compared to resources. And here we have this imbalance between the uh, equation between population and uh, resources. So how can we balance? As the moderator said, uh, UAE is depending is, is importing 85%. So how can we achieve or strike the balance between population and uh, resources? During the pandemic, and uh, that was in the country and in other countries to achieve self-sufficiency. Whatever the percentage is, 30%, 40%, what we can achieve in terms of self-sufficiency things that are already produced in the country and other things that are related to dairy because these are costly as uh, it happened in then you can grow and expand the production and you can balance between the population and uh, the amount produced and as long as the government is willing to bear the cost UAE and Saudi market and the Saudi market can be a, a more uh, relatively more successful because the population is bigger three fold or triple three fold bigger so and the government is so the more I increase the uh, crops and produce I can reduce the uh, price so if we take this direction we are doing this because we want self-sufficiency during the pan during the pandemic if you remember especially when in terms of dairy during the pandemic uh, the markets here only provided uh, locally produced products but this is uh, mainly we are talking here about uh, uh, short shelf life products Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. My question is, what are the maximum extent of uh, economic security? And from your perspective, if we put hierarchy in terms of uh, food security, how would you regard this? F firstly, we have to have self-sufficiency in the goods that the country can produce without uh, the government uh, subsidy S so if i want to achieve self if i want to achieve or realize uh, uh, self sufficiency in terms of bread for example while the country is bearing or paying 5 billion uh, us dollars this is not kind of self sufficiency so i have to have uh, products that uh, I can have without uh, burden, financial burden on the government. Also, I have to depend on different countries that can produce what I need at better prices. So I have to uh, import my uh, foods from countries depending on the availability of and the population of that country. Bhutan. For example, if you visited Bhutan, the rice paddies and regions are vast, spacious. Wherever you look, you will see rices, paddies. But do you, did you know before that Bhutan is a key player in terms of producing rice? So, no. So most of the countries that produce bread and wheat they consume what they 
uh, grow from wheat and bread. So I have to see countries that can have the resources, but the population is less. I remember uh, uh, in a conversation with the Singaporean ambassador, um, I have done my research and one of the countries that I reached is Bhutan. He said we started to Bhutan, we, we, we started the uh, negotiations with Bhutan to invest uh, in, 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 in growing rice in Bhutan because they haven't reached their potential. So, so self-sufficiency in goods because they should be done without dependence on support from the government or subsidy from the government. I have to diversify uh, the regions and the countries from which I export or import rice. Third, the strategic storage of long life uh, products, especially rice and wheat, and the better or the best for me is my storage uh, should not only be sufficient to AEs but to the whole region. Because if I have, for example, kind of problems, for example, I want to send uh, uh, to send aids, food aids to Egypt to Sudan, I should be able to do this without affecting my food security. Fourth. What are the sol new solutions, innovative solutions, and new technologies that I can use to achieve food security? In Singapore, for example, they have farms for some vegetables. They are vertical farms, and they do it on roofs, on tops of houses and buildings, such as uh, it's the same as solar uh, energy. So on the top of on the tops of buildings and houses, uh, fruits, vegetables are grown to suffice the residents. Last question. Roda Asayer, diplomatic student in Anwar Gargash Diplomatic Academy. Thank you for the lecture. Two questions. When you talked about technology used in food security, we, we based on Abraham Accords, we will take uh, technology from Israel to achieve food security. Uh, during the war going on now, how can this affect this project or agreement. Second, what are the diplomatic plans for UAAs in this domain? How can, as a dipl diplomat and ambassador in this field, how can we use food security diplomacy for the first question, what is happening in the region? This doesn't mean that uh, there is no uh, relation or no transactions are going on. It could go slowly a bit because there are some problems. You know, war is the, uh, can affect investments, investors, and can uh, sometimes can be some disruptions because of the wars. Diplomacy can play two part role. The delegations, the, the economic and commercial delegations can uh, seek opportunities when we are visiting these countries to seek a new relations and a new uh, 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 investment opportunities. So when we visit these, when, when our delegations visit such countries, we know these opportunities. The second part during COVID, because we have as a prepared, because we have an already prepared study, it was easy for us to have list for the countries from which we can get our food. Bread from Myanmar, for example, Thailand, Vietnam. But during that time, Vietnam had ban at that time. India also would put ban on such uh, exports of such food. So in your plan, you have to be ready. If you have a crisis, you have to be 
solutions and you have to anticipate a crisis and accordingly make your plans and how to depend and diversify uh, your uh, choices. And this part was uh, done and depended when we signed an agreement with India. That's uh, all for today at the end of this lecture. And on behalf of His Excellency, General Director of the Center, we'd like to rethink again His Excellency, Dr. Abdel Nasser Jamal Ashali, and thank you for, for you, uh, dear attendees. And see you in other lectures.